We're going to be in Luke chapter 24 in our Bibles, if you want to turn there, Luke chapter 24. And the title of the sermon today, if you're taking notes, is Our Greatest Need. Heard of a story, maybe you heard of this one too. Three sons who left home went out on their own and they prospered. And once they made their money, they got back together and had fun kind of discussing the gifts they had got their mom, their elderly mother. The first said, after I made it, I built mom a big house. She always wanted a big house for us, and I was blessed to be able to give it to her. The second said, well, I sent her a Mercedes with a driver. She always wanted to enjoy a nice car. And the third smiled and said, I've got you both beat. You know how mom enjoys the Bible. You know, she can't read very well. She can't see. And so I sent her a parrot that can recite the entire Bible. And it took 20 monks in a monastery 12 years to teach him. I had to pledge $100,000 a year for 10 years, a million bucks, but it was worth it. Mom just has to name chapter and verse, and the parrot will actually recite the Bible chapter and verse. Well, soon thereafter, the mom sent out letters to her son saying thank you. To the first, she said, Milton, the house you built is so huge. I live only in one room. I have to clean the whole house. It's a bit much. To Marvin the second, she said, thank you, son, I, I'm, I'm, but I'm too old to travel. I stay at home all the time, and so I don't really use the Mercedes too much. The driver is so rude. To the third, she wrote, dearest Melvin, you are the only son to have a good sense to know what your mother likes. Thank you so much. The chicken was delicious. <laughs> yeah, she ate it. Yeah, this is, this is, these are the jokes, Okay. The title of the message today is Our Greatest Need. Let me ask you today, what is our greatest need? Is it air? Is it water? Is it good LA food? I think our great, two greatest needs are things that all humans want in life. We want the good life. We want happiness here on earth, peace and joy. And we want eternal life. We want to live forever and keep on enjoying the good life. We truly just want the good life. We truly just want to live forever. That's why we're trying to stay young. We're trying to do all these treatments to stay young. We want to live forever. We want to live long, happy, enjoyable lives. And we pursue everything to gain the good life, don't we? Success, money, power, achievements. We pursue vacation and adventures and experience. We want to feel good. Uh, we use whatever is near to escape. We'll escape through food or a good TV show, movie, a glass of wine. We'll even have use all kinds of things to escape the reality that we're in. We pursue more material things because we think we actually need them for status or luxury. We want to be healthy. We want to live longer. We want to have these enjoyable lives. We search endlessly for knowledge, don't we? From chat, GPT, to university, we want the power of knowing. We search out love here in LA because we want to be accepted. We pursue art, creating, imagining, escaping into another world we wish we had. We pursue causes, political movements, hoping to make life better for others. The truth is, most of these things are not bad in and of themselves. The problem only begins when we expect them to give us what they can't. We believe these things will make us feel good about ourselves, and we believe that there is an actual payout in these things. That's why we pursue them. But we are seeking for life in the things of this earth instead of seeking the life and the one who made the earth, the one who gives life to us, the one who can take life away, of course, the giver and taker of life. He is where life is found. He is what we ultimately need. How can we seek for everything in the world except for the one who made it? We wonder why these things don't satisfy. It's because we are seeking the creation instead of the creator. And these things weren't created to satisfy us, and that's why they don't. We achieve something, we get to a certain place, we experience something, and we say, that's not good enough. That was great, I liked it, but I need a bit more. I need something else. All of these things were created to point us back to the one who actually satisfies. You know, when you see a sunset, or you hear some beautiful music, or you come in contact with the most amazing animal, you build something new or experience something breathtaking and adventurous, it moves us to be in awe, right? It moves us to say, wow, and it should move us. 
But it shouldn't move us to worship it, but it should move us to worship the one who made it and enjoy the earth that he has given to us. It seems to take a lifetime to figure out what life is all about, and then it's over. We spend all of our lives pursuing all these things, and then we get to the end of our lives, and we're standing back looking at it, and we say, oh, this is what life is about. Only if we could find the good life now and then walk in it forever. It was Jerry Seinfeld who said this about death. According to most studies, he said people's number one fear is public speaking. Number two is death, he says. Death is number two. Does that seem right? That seems, uh, that means to the average person, if you have to go to a funeral, you're better off in the casket than having to stand up and give the eulogy, right? Population Reference Bureau claims that, there, that 108 billion people have walked the earth since 8,000 BC. There are currently 7.7 .7 billion people on the earth today. That means 100 billion people have died and stepped into eternity. How many of those people do we remember? Who seems to be the one person that has swept the earth with popularity? Is it not the Lord Jesus? Why? How did he get so popular? You know, he was only in the public eye for three years. He was only public Instagram profile for three years. How has he swept the earth? And we're still talking about him here today. Well, he did something that no one can do. He raised himself from the dead. And that is the one thing that humans cannot seem to figure out. And no religious guru, no leader, no political figure, no one has ever raised himself from the dead. He's done the one thing. He actually said he would do it. And then he actually did it. And then his followers went on proclaiming it that he actually did it all the way to their deaths, saying it, it's true. They're being tortured to death. They're proclaiming it's still true. You think one of them would have said, man, it's a spoof. It's a myth. We just made this thing up. Don't kill me. They all said it was true. He solved the one thing people wish they had the answer to, life and death. So how do we find the good life? How do I live forever in that good life? We're going to answer both of these questions today. We're going to be in Luke chapter 24 in our Bibles. Can we stand for the reading of God's word? We always stand for the reading of God's word to pay honor to him, to remember whose word we're reading, not my words. They belong to him. It's his story. It's his opinion. It's his ways. Let's look at what happened this day 2,000 years ago. Luke chapter 24, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Sunday... At early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened that while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And when the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again? And they remembered his words. And when they returned from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the rest of the women were with them, were there. They were telling these things to the apostles, but these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they were not believing them. But Peter stood up and ran to the tomb, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen wrappings only, and he went away by himself, marveling at what had happened. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the blessing of the resurrection and we celebrate on this day what you have done. You have conquered death and the grave. You have conquered difficult life and struggle, pain and suffering and sin. You have given us life in that abundantly. In an eternity with you forever. And I pray now resurrection would be imparted to everyone here today. That we would go from death to life. That we would go from sorrow to joy that we go from pain to healing. God, that you would revive our lives in a new, fresh way today for your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. 
Notice it was the first day of the week, Sunday, and it was very early, the text says. On Friday, which we just celebrate, Jesus was crucified and laid in a grave. Good Friday. It is very early Sunday morning in our text, and the women who followed Jesus were up bringing spices to the tomb. Verse 2 says, They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They must have been shocked. First, how did this big stone get rolled away? away tombs were above ground more like caves in that day and a carved uh, stone was put in front of this door of the cave and here we see that the door was opened and jesus was gone they were also wondering who took the body we don't see any blood trail where's the body what's going on when I was living in Israel for a little while, it's about 15 years ago, we got to go in to where they think Jesus was laid in the borrowed tomb of the rich man in a garden with a cistern under that garden. It kind of maps out every place where they think Christ would have been buried outside of the city there. And right next to the place called Golgotha. And when we got in there, uh, we had asked the gatekeeper there one time late at night. We went there often. We said, we want to do something that no one has ever got to do. And he's like, really? I'm like, yeah, what, what, what can we do? You know, is there anything? You, can we go down to the cistern or something? You know, and he's like, listen, I'm going to show you. He takes us into the tomb. Now, it's all gated off where they believe Jesus was uh, laid down in that tomb and all of a sudden he unlocks the gate the iron gates and he opens them and says why don't you guys go in and sit down and we're like what and we go in there and we sit down and me and the buddies we're just like laying there in the spot that they believe just reminiscing processing the story and i end up thinking to myself how in the world do you lose the body of the most popular person to ever walk the earth how Really, it got stolen and that story didn't get out? Where is the body? Verse 4, and it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, the ladies, that behold, two men standing by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? As they are racking their brains trying to figure out what happened, two men in shining garments show up. What? What did these guys look like? This is crazy because it says that the women were afraid. They see these spiritual beings and they bow down to the ground. And these angels say, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not dead. Why, why have you come to the place of the dead to seek the one who is alive? Jesus is alive, they pondered. They were troubled, wondering what had happened, and here angels appear to them. What are you doing? Remember how he spoke to you when he was in Galilee, verse 6, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and the third day rise again. The Lord told them up front exactly the blueprint, exactly the plan, how it would take place. He told all of his followers this up front. And it says in verse 8, Then the, the women remembered his words. So two things. Number one, the angels tell the ladies, Jesus is risen. And number two, then they say, don't you remember? He told you this. When Jesus was born, Matthew 1, the angel said, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. He's not even born yet. Mary's just realizing she's pregnant. He says, you're going to, it's a boy. You're going to call his name Jesus, and there's a plan. He's going to save his people from their sins. You see, Jesus came to earth with a mission to serve and save people, to serve and save us. Jesus said of himself in Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man came not to serve, came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, came down to the earth not to be served, he came to serve you. He came to serve me. He came to lay his life down for us. Look at verse 9 to 11. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. And it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of Jesus, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. Jesus entrusted the ladies 
with the testimony from the angels as the proof to tell the disciples he had risen. And the guys didn't listen to the ladies. Isn't this how it is today, ladies? The women knew before Jesus' own disciples knew. Very interesting note there, that God would entrust the story of the risen Lord to the women who were not the ones to be, to, to be gone to in that society, in that culture, in that day. They're not going to go to the women to hear the testimony of the witness. They are going to go to the men first, but God says, I got a different way. I'm going to give it to the ladies, and they're going to tell the men. It's backwards and upside down. I love it. And verse 11 says, the disciples did not believe. It gives me hope. That gives us hope. Yes, even Jesus' own disciples didn't believe at first. You're in good company. Though he had told them over and over, boys, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to die. And I'm going to rise from the dead on the third day. They weren't listening. You have to remember they were devastated. Their friend, their leader, their savior, their king, their messiah had just been arrested, beaten, bloodied, crucified, and killed right in front of their eyes. They were absolutely crushed and broken. They thought they were going to conquer with him. And their general was now gone. And they ran and hid. They were scared to death. They thought the same was going to happen to them. Their fearless leader was gone, and they were all alone. They were hiding and in doubt. They didn't just believe. And that's some of our stories here today now, isn't it? You didn't just believe at first, but the Lord drew you to himself through a series of events. Some of you are coming close to the Lord Jesus for the first time in a while, and today you are here, and we're happy you're here. We're blessed to have you. Some of you are coming to believe for the first time, and we celebrate that with you. You picked the perfect day to believe on the Lord Jesus. It's the same day the disciples believe too, so you are in good company. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, you know what Jesus says to you? Come to me, all of you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. This is what Napoleon said about Jesus. He says, I've heard lots of statements from a lot of men, from a lot of generals, from a lot of kings, from a lot of leaders. Yes, that Napoleon Bonaparte, but I've never heard any of them say, come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's different. I believe his God, God has brought you here today to find rest. And before our service closes, I'm going to pray for you that today you find rest for your soul. So after the angels tell the women Jesus has risen from the dead, they go and tell the disciples, just as we saw, none of them believe the women except Peter. He kind of believed a little bit, which is classic Peter, right? He's always got to go all in. He always has his foot in his mouth. He's a thousand percent in before anybody else even goes one percent in. He's like, I'm game. Let's go. Look at verse 12, but Peter arose and ran to the tomb, it says. So he just starts sprinting. He's just running. And stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves. He departed, marveling to himself what had happened. So Peter runs to the tomb. He stoops down to look in, and he's shocked. He's like, where is the Lord? What's going on? John's gospel tells it this way. It's kind of funny. The Bible has humor in it. It says in John chapter 20, verse 3, Peter went out and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb together. So John is writing this as the author, and he starts telling the story from his perspective, what really happened. It sounds like this. So uh, Peter, therefore, went out and the other disciple, this is John, he's the one writing it, and we're going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter. <laughs> he has to make the point. <laughs> I beat Peter to the tomb. I can beat him in the mile. And he came to the tomb first. Is this a race, John? He has to point it out. Notice the author writes that they found linen cloths lying in the tomb. Yeah, so what? Some think that Jesus' body was stolen, but how do you explain the most famous person's body on the earth gone missing? And notice grave robbers don't unravel burial clothes first before taking the body. They found the linen cloths, burial bandages, evidence that he has risen. Is that what, is that what grave robbers do? They unwrap the body. 
freshly killed, freshly killed two, three days ago, laying there. You want to unwrap the whole thing, lay it there, maybe fold it up, you know, nice little package, put it there. No, nobody does that. They're going to steal the body. They're just going to run in there and grab the body and run with the linen cloths. The text tells us the, the linen cloths were left there. Remember, their best friend, the leader, the king, was put to death at 33 years old. Yes, he was only 33 years old. They were devastated. Now Peter and John standing there staring at the grave in awe. He's gone. He rose from the dead just like he said he would. Peter and John were beside themselves in this moment. They probably started jumping and shouting and praising God. The Lord is alive. He's alive. Tears of joy and laughter, just like he said he was. He did it. When they saw the resurrection, they were changed by it immediately. It's that moment when they're staring at the tomb. that We know he was just here. And all of a sudden it hits them. And they realize, oh my gosh, he's risen from the dead, just like he said he was going to. They were changed immediately. It hit them like a train. The Lord had told them many times over and over that he would rise, but they didn't get it. One time Peter even tried to rebuke Jesus for saying he would go to the cross. And the Lord said to him, get behind me, Satan. I am going to the cross. I am going to pay for the sins of the world. No one will stand in my way. I will be crucified, and I will rise from the dead. This was all foretold. It was all planned. This is the resurrection we celebrate today. Many times when we think of Easter and the resurrection of Jesus, we don't understand the implications of it. Yes, okay, Jesus rose from the dead. It's a miracle for sure. But what does that have to do with us? And what's so important about a guy rising from the dead? Let me give you three reasons why the resurrection of Jesus is the greatest event in all of history. What if a man really rose himself from the dead? What does that mean? How does it affect us personally? Point number one, the resurrection is the proof. The resurrection proves that everything Jesus said and did is true. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, said the resurrection is a fact better attested than any event recorded in any history, whether ancient or modern. And it is true. If you don't believe me, you should research it yourself. C.S. Lewis, Je Lewis, the great writer, said, Jesus has forced open a door that has been locked since the death of the first man. He has met and fought and beaten the king of death. Everything is different because he has done so. In his resurrection, Christ proved what he came to do was true. How so? Well, the people in Jesus' day and that time wanted proof as well to verify what he was saying and doing was true. You can't go around saying you're the Messiah. You can't go around saying you're the Son of God. You can't walk up to people and say your sins are forgiven. You ever do that on the street? You just walk up, I forgive you of, your, of all your sins. You're like, what? This guy's crazy. You can't do that to people. And they called blasphemy on him many times, pick up stones to throw at him and kill him because it's like, hey, you can't walk around saying you're the son of God. You can't walk around saying you're the Messiah. You can't walk around saying that you can forgive people's sins. Give us a sign proving to us all of this is true. John chapter 2, verse 18. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus was Jewish. He was amongst his own people. They all knew the law and the Torah. They were having conversations among themselves as a tribe and a family. He said, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? They're talking about the temple that Solomon built, that Herod helped rebuild. Will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The resurrection of Jesus is the center of Christianity. Without this proof, Christianity isn't true. Jesus would be dead, and everything he said would be bogus. If you are a skeptic or an atheist or an agnostic, and you want to research and disprove, disprove the resurrection. 
It is the hinges upon which the door of Christianity swings on. If you disprove the resurrection, the whole thing is over. If you destroy the resurrection, Christianity is all a lie. But if he really did raise from the dead, then guess what? Everything he said was true. Somebody starts saying bogus, wild stuff, and then he says, you don't believe me? Show up at my funeral. I'm going to raise from the dead. Okay. I'm game. I'm going to find you. That means that he was really the son of God, the Messiah, virgin born, the only way to God, the bread of life, the good shepherd, the prince of peace, the savior of the world. He was all of those things. And he actually is imparting to his people, to us today, everything he said about the earth, everything he said about family, everything he said about society, everything he said about creation, everything he has said about the way that we live and move and breathe, all of it is true. And that he has the keys to this life. And he's trying to tell you what the good life is all about. Larry King, a great interviewer, once said, that if he could choose one person to interview, as he interviewed thousands of people, if he could choose one person to interview, he would choose to interview Jesus Christ himself. King said that he would like to ask Jesus if he was indeed virgin born. He added, that answer to that question would define history for me. Even Larry King wanted to know, did he rise from the dead? Was he virgin born? These things split time in half, literally. Point number two, the resurrection brings eternal life. Not only is it a proof for Christianity, it brings eternal life. Humans have a huge problem on this earth. No one has been able to fix it, death. It's the most awkward, unnatural thing for a human to experience now, isn't it? For just a bunch of animals running around with no purpose, no direction. Just gather a bunch of money and spend and live life for me and then die and the thing's over. There's no purpose, none at all. We're just a bunch of animals floating on this ball. No purpose. If there is no purpose, why are people so crushed and moved over and over by death? What does it even matter? It's not that big of a deal. Why are you so sad? It is the most unnatural thing on the planet to know someone closely and have them die. It shatters a person to the core, spiritually, emotionally, even physically. We are trapped when that happens. Time stops for everyone. Why? Because we are made to live forever. We are made to be with God forever. He built a garden. He built the earth for us to enjoy and play and have fun. Worship me, walk with me, love me. Know me, love your neighbor, enjoy life, build, create the Garden of Eden, have fun. And sin messed it all up and brought disease and darkness and depression and hatred. The resurrection of Christ is the good news, but the bad news is what Christ had to go through to bring us the resurrection. We just celebrated Good Friday. Do you know the only reason that Friday is good is because of the really bad day that Jesus had. Jesus took the full punishment of our sin on the cross so that we could go free before God. You know, sin can't go unpunished before a holy God. God is good and righteous, and he is a judge and will not let people get away with wickedness and sin on the earth. People are doing terrible things to each other, and no one gets away. He is the judge. The Hitlers of the world will face their judge. No one gets away. Sin has separated us from God, and it brings punishment upon us on the cross. So Jesus was taking the punishment for our sin on the cross so we could go free. In all four Gospels, we are told of the story of Jesus being arrested, brought before Pilate to be condemned. Do you remember? And Pilate concludes that the Lord Jesus is innocent and has done nothing wrong. He's like, what's wrong with you people? He, he did nothing wrong. He's innocent. And so he tries to get out of condemning Jesus multiple times. Even his wife tells him, do not do anything to this guy. Let him go. I had a dream about him. Don't touch him. Pilate attempts, as in the custom of Passover, to release a prisoner of choice, remember? And he's like, of course, they're going to release Jesus. So he brings 
uh, a well-known criminal. Everybody knows this terrible guy before all the people. His name is Barabbas. They had Barabbas stand there in front of all the people, and they got the innocent son of God, Jesus. And when the moment comes to decide who to set free, the crowd starts chanting, crucify Jesus. Crucify Jesus. He says, should I crucify the sinner Barabbas or the innocent Jesus? The people chant louder and louder, crucify Jesus. Pilate is perplexed. How is it that the criminal sinner goes free from the cross and the innocent Lord Jesus is crucified? This is our story, church. Isn't it? We were the ones guilty. We were the ones who sinned before God. We were the ones sent us to death. And the Lord Jesus, the innocent one, the Son of God is standing there. The Messiah is the one who was chosen to die in my place. I go free and he goes to the cross. He was treated as if he committed all of my sins. He was paying the penalty for my sin on the cross so I can go free. How can this be? Even Barabbas himself, I'm sure, walking away thinking, what is going on? There are lyrics to a song by Josiah Queen. He writes this, I am Barabbas. You took upon my cross. I was that prisoner till you bought my bond with blood. I can't run away from, my accu- from what my accusers say because I am Barabbas. Oh, I am Barabbas. I am Barabbas, your friend. We are Barabbas. And I'm telling you, he went to the cross and you get to go free. How can this be? Amazing love, how can it be that you, my king, would die for me? I think Barabbas was just as shocked as we are. We should not be going free on that day. Jesus should be. But Jesus declares forgiven on the cross for you and for me. You are forgiven, Barabbas. You can go free. I stood in your place. I took your penalty. Jesus took hell upon himself so that you don't have to go there. You and I, we will not end up in hell because there isn't a way out. The only way you will end up there is because you reject the gift of Christ and your sin has not been forgiven. You say, I don't want your gift. I don't want your sacrifice. I don't want your forgiveness. You will have to pay for it yourself. But Jesus has made a way, praise God. There is a heaven and hell and Christ made a way for us to be forgiven of all of our sin and saved from eternal judgment. Do you know that God didn't make hell for humans? Did you know that? The Bible tells us it was made for the devil and his fallen angels, his demons. Those who go there only go there who don't want God. Those who want nothing to do with God, no one will get there by surprise. It will only be those who truly desire no relationship with the God who made them. You know what hell is? It is simply the absence of God. The absence of everything that is good, light, peace, rest, happiness, joy, fun, love, righteousness, and truth. If you don't want God, you can have it that way for eternity. But God says, over my dead body, I will make a way for you. I will pursue you. And even if you've ran away from home, the doors are open. The gates of heaven are open. The kingdom is open. Christ has made a way. You need to know that God loves you, and he offers you forgiveness and grace. He loves you. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, that's why he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish. You will have everlasting life. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you not wishing that any should perish, but all would come to repentance. 1 Timothy 2, 3, this is good and is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants to give you eternal life in heaven and forgiveness for your sins today. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He is given himself as a gift. Jesus said this in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, Jesus said, even though he dies, 
If you believe in him, you will live. Whoever believes in Jesus, though he dies, will live in heaven forever with God. I've had many loved ones step into eternity, my brother, my mother, my, grand, my grandpa. And if the resurrection is not true, then they have all died, and I will never see them again. Let's be honest. But if it is true, I will see them again soon, and it is true. The resurrection is real and needed, and why do our hearts long for that? Why do we want something after death on this earth? Without the resurrection, there is no hope. Humans will just die. But why do we have such a problem with that? Why do we hurt so bad over this? It's because we're not made to die. We're made to live forever with God and enjoy his earth. Sin has infected this place and it separates us from God. But he has made a way to save us from hating and hurting each other. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then get on loving each other. And the third commandment I like to add to it, don't tell anybody, get on enjoying the earth that he has given you. Enjoy, have fun, love the Lord, catch some waves, climb some mountains, love and serve each other in Jesus' name. Maybe you don't know you'll go to heaven when you die, but you want to. I'm going to give you that opportunity to make things right with God today. Don't worry. Finally, the resurrection brings the good life now. John 10, 10, Jesus said the thief, the devil, the enemy, the Satan himself comes only to steal, kill, and destroy you. Never trust him. Never do a handshake. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus rose from the dead so that you would be raised to life right now in this life, right now in this moment, a glimpse of heaven right now today, a resurrected spiritual life. We're dead spiritually, and we need resurrection to have new eyes that see in color, new eyes that see in peace and love and joy. How do I get that? You need heart surgery. You need God to take out that heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. You need to go from death to life, resurrection. That's why he did it. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way. I am the way you're looking for. I am the truth. And I am the life that you are seeking. No one will get to the Father. No one will get to God except through me. Jesus said that? Yes, no one will get to God except through him. He was either a liar and a lunatic, or he might be telling the truth. Jesus wants to give you the true life here on this earth, of meaning and purpose, a life of blessing and salvation. It's the life you've been searching for. You're made to worship God and enjoy the earth he's made. If you worship anything else, I promise you it'll make you sick. Money, success, power, fame, sex, drugs, alcohol, material things, status, if you worship anything other than God, it will make you sick, I promise you. This is not a religion with God. This is a relationship with God. He wants you to know him as a father. He wants relationship with you. Jesus said, if anybody wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. God wants to resurrect your life today, and there is no greater way to celebrate Easter than to celebrate in resurrection to give your life over to god for the first time or maybe for the tenth time but to give your life over maybe you're saying well what must i do to be saved from my sins forgiven by god and go to heaven when i die you must number one realize that you've sinned against god for all have sinned and fall short of his glory even me yep you pastor oh yeah ask my wife okay we've all sinned and fall short of god's glory you must recognize what Jesus has done for you in taking your punishment on the cross. You must repent of your sins. Stop running away from God and start running to God with all of your heart. That's what it means to repent. Just stop running away from God. Start running to him with all of your heart. And finally, you must receive Jesus as Lord and Savior over your life. I am no longer the captain of my own ship. Nope. I relinquish he is the Lord. He is the King. I give it to Him. I trust your ways. I'm going to trust you, God. And you make Him Savior over your life. Save me from myself. Help me. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. 
If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness, so God sent us a Savior. Jesus is the Savior you're looking for. Jesus is the King you're looking for. It's not found in this world. The good life and eternal life is found in Him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we, we love you. We bless you in this place. And God, I pray for everyone here today. You know where they're at. You know their story. And I pray, God, that you would save now. God, that you would forgive now. Lord, that you would bring resurrection power now that you would give people the gift of heaven even right now, life in that abundantly forever. While our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and we're praying, you say, Pastor Josh, that's me. Would you pray for me? I want to believe on Jesus with all of my heart. I want resurrection in my life. I want to walk with Jesus as Lord and Savior. I'm making a step of faith today. Would you change my life, God, you're saying, internally? If that's you, would you raise up your hand? I'd love to pray for you right now. God bless you. Yep, and you over here. Anybody else? God bless you. Anybody else? Raise up your hand as a sign of faith saying, God, that's me. God bless you in the back. Yes, anybody else? Raise up your hand saying, God, please hear my prayer. Please forgive me of my sin. Please give me the gift of heaven. I want to know that when I die, I'll be with you. Anybody else? Would you raise up your hand? I'd love to pray for you. Yes, all of you. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to ask those of you who are believers, maybe you need to recommit your life to the Lord today. You just have been wandering. You're just not walking close with the Lord. This is a great day to recommit your life to the Lord. Would you raise up your hand? Let me pray for you. God bless all of you. Yes. Anybody else? Yes. In Jesus' name. Yes. Father, I pray for all of these raising their hands and even those raising in their hearts just saying, God, save me. I pray that they would pray this prayer, that they would cry out to you that you would save them in this moment let's say this to the lord lord jesus i know that i'm a sinner i know that i've fallen away i know that i've done wrong before you god would you forgive me of my sin i believe in your death burial and resurrection would you resurrect my life I repent of my sin. I turn away from running away from you, and I turn to you with all of my life. Would you be my Lord? Would you be my Savior? Would you be my friend? Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to walk with you from this day forward. I give you my life from this day on. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I pray for all of these who have prayed that you would seal these promises in you, that this covenant would be carried on into eternity. They would walk with you. You would meet them this day for the rest of their lives. Would you impart to them joy, peace, forgiveness, and rest even today? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.